Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I am Valerie Geckler. I'm Starista's Senior Vice President of Client Services. Both Aaron and I, who I'll introduce in just a moment, work at Starista. And I wanted to share some background about Starista and what we do so that you all have better context for the conversation we're all about to have in the background we're bringing when we're going to dive into some great details about email. Starista is a data and marketing solutions company. We focus on helping our clients find and retain customers. Because we have the data component to our business, we have data profiles on individuals and businesses to help our, our clients identify and have ways to reach their ideal client profile. And then we help them reach those customers across whatever marketing channel is best suited for them. We specialize in CTV and display advertising, social advertising, and the topic of today, email. I like to give an example of what that means. That's very conceptual. So let's imagine uh, if, if you guys are familiar with, there's a number of premium dog food companies. So they will actually formulate dog food specifically for your pet, and they will ship it direct to consumers' homes. So let's imagine you're that business. You know that you want, and you're trying to find new customers. You know you want households that, one, have dogs, and you know that you want households that, two, probably have a certain household income level where it would make sense for them to invest in a premium dog food purchase. So working with Starista, we're gonna help you find contacts that fit that criteria, and then we'll help market to those people. The benefit is that if, if you're the marketer that's trying to do this, you're spending your advertising dollars on people that you know are most likely to do business with you. So it's gonna get you a better ROI on your marketing dollars and how you spend them. For myself, I am, I mentioned I'm the head of our client services department. What my department focuses on is making sure that that ROI comes to life. So we work very closely with the other departments within Starista that are in charge of campaign execution, campaign operations, and we act as liaison between clients and our internal teams to make sure that those campaigns run smoothly. And like I said, there's great return on investment. Today, in addition to hearing from me, you're going to hear from Senior Vice President of Email Solutions, Aaron Reyna. Good afternoon, Aaron. Hi, Valerie. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, that was a, a, a very good example you gave uh, just now. Uh, of email marketing in a nutshell. Um, like Valerie said, Aaron Reyna, uh, I've been overseeing the email solutions team over here for almost 10 years. And um, we've, in short, we send a lot of emails, let's put it that way. Um, so we're, we'll obviously talk through, uh, the main focus of this will be around the acquisition uh, efforts uh, that our clients have and how we help support that. Um, and I think a lot of people, when they think of email marketing, they think of newsletters, um, how do I keep my customers engaged, which is, all, we'll touch on that as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, what a lot of marketers aren't familiar with is the intricacies and, 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 the, and the, the struggle uh, there is and, and why you need partners to help with the acquisition effort. Um, so a strong email partner, a strong data partner, um, strong, you know, creative team, uh, it all comes together. Um, and it, it, it does, uh, like I said, you know, newsletters and emailing your, your customers is, is definitely the top priority for a lot of email marketers. Um, but we like to kind of, we're like, we're going to dive in a little into the acquisition aspect, uh, which we feel is sometimes underutilized. Um, so it's been around for so long, so. Absolutely. So when Aaron says we send a lot of emails, uh, between my team and his team, we sent well over 1 billion, a billion with a B, B as in boy, 
uh, over 1 billion emails together last year. So when I, in preparing for this webinar and thinking about the fellow marketers that are gonna be on this call for us, um, if I was in your shoes, I would be thinking, what are those businesses that are sending over a billion emails doing? What might they know about email, a tried and true channel that we all know about? Um, what might those businesses know and be doing and what kind of ROI are they seeing that we might be able to share some of that knowledge to help some of you? So that's really the focus of our discussion today. Because we send so many emails, we've had an opportunity to learn some things that work, some things that don't, some things that are really helpful to make sure campaigns are successful and you're getting what you want out of it. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. And Aaron queued it up really nicely. I wanna make sure we don't get too jargony. So I'm gonna start with a really jargony question and then I'm gonna ask Aaron if he can break it down for us. So um, a lot of times, internally at least, we'll talk about whether an email campaign is a first party email campaign or a third party email campaign. And that's in reference to where the emails are coming from. But that's super jargony. And I think there's a better way to describe both first party and third party. So Aaron, to help us lay groundwork, so everybody's speaking the same language as us as we proceed through the webinar, could you break that down, the difference between when we're saying first party email and third party email? What do we want people to know about that? Yeah, sure. So first party, uh, it's probably easier to describe what first party is, and then everything else is pretty much third party, to be honest. Uh, so first party would be when you make a purchase or whenever you, you register for a newsletter, you're explicitly opting in to receive content from a brand or from a company, right? So uh, when you go through a purchase and at the end, it asks you a checkbox, would you like to receive updates and newsletters and you have it checked, you're part of their first party email campaigns moving forward. Um, or if you go to an event and you want to sign, you know, you want to get a coupon and they, you give them your email address to sign up to be part of the newsletter, you're part of their, you're, they're part of their first party uh, customer. So, uh, so, so anyone who has uh, e expressed interest and explicitly opted in to receive emails from you would be first party. Uh, anyone else is third party. Uh, there's, there's maybe even people that would say there's such thing as second party. It's a little kind of confusing, uh, but basically anyone who hasn't opted, hasn't, isn't an existing customer, hasn't checked, you know, done that checkbox, wants to receive emails from you, uh, then they would be third party. So those are, those are individuals that prospects or potential acquisitions of, I need a, I, you know, I want them to be part of my newsletter. I want them to, to start purchasing from me. I want them to sign up and receive offers in the future. Um, and that's kind of the main, that's the, the difference um, right there, so. Okay, well, let's start with, I think the thing a lot of people are very familiar with is <clears throat> that customer email. And, you know, there's a lot of different platforms and tools people may be familiar with. In another life, I used a lot of MailChimp, Constant Contact, um, I've deployed emails through Pardot and Marketo. You know, those are probably platforms that are really familiar to our friends that are joining us today and um, probably what's most familiar to marketers. So I wanted to focus on first party or customer emails first and talk about what's important. What do you think makes up a good campaign? What's going to make a email campaign successful when I'm talking to my own customers and the people that have said they want to receive email from me? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there's a there's a lot going on in that question. Uh, it really boils down to uh, how do you get your customers most engaged, uh, and that answer actually you don't know until you actually engage with them, not through not just through email but through various channels, and and not just saying I'm going to send my customers an email every week, and that's how I engage with them. You it, you know a lot of, of of I think a lot of marketers kind of forget is uh, they come up with a strategy or a plan, which is great. You need to have a strategy and plan, uh, but then that's it. They stick to it. So uh, I, I would like to say that 
you know, a great email campaign or a great marketing campaign, um, you know, does the, the, the strategy could be for a year, but the actual campaign shouldn't last a year, right? So you want to be able to adapt. You want to be able to test. You want to know uh, which creatives are working, which subject lines are people engaging with, um, you know, which channels are, are, you know, getting people to the website, which channels are, you know, where, how long does it take someone to go from receiving an email or viewing a, a CTV ad to, oh, when they finally make a purchase? You know, and is it seasonal? You know, are there, are, are there, uh, is, is it geographical? There's all types of reasons why a, a campaign could be successful or not. Um, so you don't really just want to focus on one thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think that uh, all of the, the you know, you, you can Google best practices, right? And you'll get, everyone's heard of subject line testing, creative testing, uh, you know, best time of day to send emails, uh, you know, maybe less known as how, you know, how often and the frequency at which I just send my emails. Um, and these are all great questions. And there's, 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 there's a lot of opinions on that. Um, and it all does apply to acquisition. Um, I think where this conversation is going to lead, though, is all of the things that make a great email campaign or make an email campaign for your customers great can also make your acquisition campaign great too. But then the marketers forget, well, there's a lot under the hood that goes on with an acquisition campaign that you don't necessarily have to worry about or think about when you're emailing your customers. Um, these are individuals that are engaged with you. So you just wanna get the most engagement, the most return, um, uh, you know, uh, return customers. You want them to stay customers for, for, for longer than just that initial purchase, right? Yeah. Uh, it's a little different mindset, though, too, than when you want individuals that have never made a purchase. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's a lot tougher. And sometimes the strategy can be different, too. But like I said, best practices applies across the board. Uh, but then there's additional best practices that I think a lot of marketers leave out. And I'm glad you brought up yeah. the, you know, MailChimp and Constant Contact and all those platforms. Once again, you, you Google marketing automation, email, ESPs. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of companies and platforms that that send email and send it well and have nice visuals and give you good reporting and let you do kind of nurture and drag and drop features, which is great. Uh, I think where it gets acquisition is lost kind of in that though, right? It, it's almost like it's almost yeah. a, a, a it's like it's a whole nother um, industry within um, sending emails or you know or, or channel, if you will. So what I always advocate for is just being conscious about what it is that you're testing. So a lot of times we'll approach that in phases. First, I want to figure out what creative is going to perform for me the best. What subject lines are going to get me the most clicks and the most engagement? Um, then I want to determine which segments are responding the best. Um, in my advocacy is just for being really conscious. Think about what your testing plan is and define what your KPIs are ahead of time. And then use, once you get data, then you can decide what should my next test be. But be conscious from the beginning of testing because Aaron, you're right. There's so many different things I can do. Um, I can personalize my emails with different graphics or I can make sure to include somebody's first name or something about attributes about them that's going to make my email seem more personal. Um, and we as marketers, we went back and talked about, I talked about return on investment at, in, as part of my intro. And so I, I'm always thinking about for all of us as marketers, what's going to get me the most bang for my book. So I am a big advocate for testing like Aaron was talking about and just be conscious about it and you need to have a plan up front before you execute it so you're not trying to reverse engineer results after you do it. Um, and so then Aaron, you were saying all those best practices that we're probably familiar with for those, those of us that are talking to our customers know about, but you started talking about if I'm sending emails for the purpose of reaching brand new people. We're all, we're all most likely in the business of wanting to find more customers, wanting more leads, um, wanting my customers to buy more. 
And that's where acquisition email or prospecting email really shines. But you started bringing up the complexities associated with it. So like that sounds so um, amorphous. That sounds so mysterious. That's a better word. Um, what are some of those things? Like, what are the special considerations that you have to make when you're doing a prospecting campaign instead of just a campaign to your known customers? Yeah, so uh, th there's two parts to that. Uh, the main, the, the first one is the data. Everything starts with the data, right? Having the right audience, having, uh, you know, clean, good, mailable emails. Um, that's, that's important. You can't get around that part. Uh, now, on the complexity part, like the, the technical difficulties um, is, uh, so for example, uh, if all you had to worry about was your audience, you can go to, you know, plenty of great data providers and they'll give you an audience of individuals within, you know, Texas that, that you can pit, sell or prospect to, right? Uh, you go to MailChimp, you go to Constant Contact, you try to load it up and send it, you're probably going to get flagged. Um, you may get bounces. Uh, they're threat. They're they're very strict about it, uh, so they don't have high tolerance for prospecting. Uh, and those those platforms and 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 companies are built around or for the first party, which is what we first talked yeah. about, right? Prospecting is so, a great tool, and we know it's we know right. prospecting email is great. So. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, so then, so then you have to kind of look under the hood, right? So it's not as simple as going out, buying off the, sh or sign up for an off the shelf uh, software and sending emails, right? Um, so things to consider is, well, how are the ISPs and, and for example, like Google and Yahoo, how are they, you know, what kind of engagement are they seeing with your emails? Um, because if it's your customers, the engagement will be fine. Now, if these are prospects, uh, the engagement is going to be you know, lower than what you would traditionally see if you're mailing to your own customers. So, so uh, you have to be cautious about the way ISPs will flag your traffic, uh, how, how many emails you're sending from a given domain or even an IP address. Uh, so uh, most people are familiar with the term the cloud. So uh, a lot of ESP solutions are cloud-based in the sense it's, it's, you know, there's a kind of a, a some of a, uh, a cloud of servers, if you will, virtual, physical, what, whichever, and, and it, you're everyone's kind of intermingled in there and sending off of these these servers. Well, uh, the problem with acquisition is it doesn't really mesh as well with the first party. Um, you got to be a little more dynamic, a little more nimble. Uh, if, if an IP address is you know is, is seeing you know uh, if, if your traffic on a particular IP address isn't getting the engagement you want you may start getting blocked on an ISP. So you need to be able to, okay, I need to register and warm up new IP addresses. I need to get, you know, new subdomains registered. Um, so a traditional email marketer may have, oh, I have my marketing dot subdomain. Every marketing material I send to my customers, I'm going to do marketing dot what, you know, company at, and it's going to, it's, and that's, that's, I'm going to use that. It's going to be great. I'll maintain my reputation. I'm going to, do all my testing, I'm gonna do all the best practices, which is great. Unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily apply to acquisition because you know of the engagement is, is so different. Um, and you're talking about the email when it lands in my inbox, the address that the email is from, right? Absolutely right. So so a lot of times if you get an email, say from like Dick Sporting Goods, it could be like offers dot dicksportinggoods.com or, or, or newsletter at whatever um, or info at or marketing at um, that that's kind of yeah so that domain is tied to an IP address which could be provided by your ESP it it could be you know it could be one you registered and set up in, in the platform um, and that's kind of you know it's a very common strategy or a very you know that's it's as straightforward as it gets I have a domain Here's the IP address it's assigned to, and then this is how I'm sending my emails, and that's how most email marketers operate, which is which is great. Uh, acquisition is a little different. You you can't just rely on one IP address, one domain. Uh, it, it's a constant battle because you know ISPs don't want to see traffic that's not engaging at a, 
you know, a first party level. And um, at the end, you know, at the end of the day, this, these are, you know, recipients that aren't necessarily expecting the email. Uh, not to say they may be familiar with your brand, uh, but but technically the the Yahoo, you know, doesn't really care to be frank what your brand is if you're sending email, um, you know, at a certain frequency, hitting email addresses that don't exist, sending, you know, five emails every day for five days straight, basically everything going against best practices, you're going to get flagged, you're going to start getting blocked. Yeah. Um, Yahoo, Yahoo in this case being the ISP that you're talking about. So it's that the ISP can, ISPs are trying to make sure only good email traffic gets through to the, their, the people with inboxes. The, the right. People yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. Inboxes. Absolutely. And not only that, they want to make sure you are, that your recipients are engaging with the email. Uh, so, uh, which actually leads to one strategy that um, I feel like it's a best practice. I don't know how common it is amongst marketers, but uh, kind of, you know, keeping your, you can almost think of it as the top of the top of the funnel uh, acquisition, right? So before they get into your nurturing campaign or your, your sales funnel, uh, they're, they're, they're essentially, they're, they're a prospect, but they have no knowledge of you at all, essentially. So anyone who engages uh, at any level, whether that's just someone who read your email, someone we know viewed a you know a CTV ad or clicked on it and uh, went to a website or web page, uh, you know that is is you know they may not be an, an acquired customer yet, but they should definitely be treated differently than say a recipient who gets an email every month from your marketing efforts and they never engage, right? Um, and that also ties back to the infrastructure, right? So you can maintain domains and subdomains and IP addresses for those people that are engaged, but not quite yet your customer. And that's that's a good strategy, regardless of what you're promoting. Uh, you should always, even in first party, to be honest too, if you have a known segment of engaged users, I know these client or these customers click on my coupon every week I send them. I know these customers do this they should be treated slightly different than just everyone else. And that also yeah. applies to acquisition, obviously, because 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 acquisition, you want to get them from, they may know you as a, band, a brand because, you know, or, or they may not know you as a brand at all to, oh, I'm going to click on the website, read about the offer, read about what they do. And then that is, you know, powerful because the great thing about email is you know who you're sending to, you know what engagement they're taking. Um, so, you know, there it's, it's, you know, it's different than say, I know people clicked on an ad per se, but beyond that, uh, you know, it's, it's a little, um, and that's just by the nature of the way email operates. It, it, yeah. it's, it's definitely, email is definitely its own channel or vehicle, as opposed to other marketing channels are almost their own sub industries, right? Like they have their own economies. You have to bid on display ads. If, if, if I'm on ESPN.com and someone wants to serve me a, an ad, uh, you know, it's going to cost them more to serve me an ad on ESPN.com than say, you know, Brian Gold's fantasy football, you know, website. So the price, the difference can be, you know, so, and with email, it's not like that, right? Email is, I send an email. I have a fixed cost. I know what it what it costs me. I know what kind of products I'm licensing or who I'm using as a partner, and uh, and it just and it just goes, and it and it goes out, and that's it. There's no pricing. There's no bidding wars. There's no having to worry about the economics of it. Email is great because you can focus on the engagement of it. So it's yeah, not. I, so yeah. I think that's that's part of the beauty of email, and I love other marketing channels too. I would I would never um, flatly advocate for always using one channel or, or another because it really is dependent on what kind of campaign you're running. But to your point, when I'm there, there's some level of mystery when I'm working with the DSP or media buying platform, or I'm working with an agency that is real-time bidding on ad placement versus email I know what my cost is going to be. It's easier to budget. It's easier for me to budget and know how many, the equivalent of impressions, how many deployments I'm going to have. So 
think the simplicity in that regard allows for maybe complexity in other areas. So I really liked what you were saying a moment ago about segmentation and treating engaged uh, recipients differently. So that's a tactic we've leveraged a lot together for some of our clients. And it's analogous to a customer journey. Maybe what would be more familiar to people thinking about their own customers and their own customer journey. Um, you can do that with acquisition email too. Essentially, we're just trying to move people deeper down a funnel, right? Absolutely. And, 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 and not to downplay the importance of other channels. Um, in fact, in Valerie, you can attest to this. We 99.9% .9 recommend a marketing a strategy or a marketing plan should include more than one channel. Include all the channels if you can, because it's kind of back to one of our first points is like, it's really about the data. And by data, I don't just mean the audience. I mean, what is happening with your campaign? That's, that's the insights, right? That's all data too. So where are your customers engaging? Are, are you seeing you know, better click-through rates on a display ad? Or are people viewing your CTV, your CTV ads at a higher rate? Are they converting maybe after two touches of an email? Or it took an email and two display impressions to get them you know, to fill out a form or, or download something. Um, so all the channels definitely, uh, and if you have a really good uh, partner, data partner, service partner, creative partner, uh, they can all kind of, you know, intermingle and, and really form a, a more robust and, and, and uh, you know, instead of like a linear, you know, you don't, the last thing you want is, like I said, is to have a plan of, I'm going to do this and I'm just going to do it for a year straight. You don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the great thing about having multiple channels is, you know, as time goes on, you know, what's working, what's not working. You can, you can, you can, you know, swap out creatives. You can, you can do interesting things like retargeting, right? So it's a pretty common mm -hmm. practice where if you're on a website, you, you add something to your cart, you don't see it, you don't make the purchase. Maybe the next day that brand sends you an email with a coupon. Uh, we'll take that further. Imagine like your, your prospect is, is, is viewing a CTV ad, right? And, uh, and they, there's a product you're promoting. Well, with maybe within 10, 20 seconds or while the ad is still playing, they get a retargeting email with a coupon for that particular product, right? Um, so I, I don't know if you know anyone that's doing that, Valerie, but um, that seems pretty powerful. Um, but, uh, I, I yeah. might be able to think of someone yeah. that, so, that but, can do that. But yeah, so as you know, as much as like my team and I like to focus on email marketing, uh, you at the very beginning, you said we're marketing solutions, right? And, and marketers should be thinking of I'm not just an email marketer. I'm not just an ad buyer, right? Because because the ultimate goal is well, whatever the goal of the campaign is, right? It's, it's acquiring new customers, yeah. getting them to sign up for a newsletter, or whatever that is. Um, so we can't be so tunnel, you know, we shouldn't have tunnel vision. Um, I know everyone thinks their approach is, is the best, their strategy is the best. Um, and you have to start somewhere, obviously. Uh, but uh, but that's why it's, it's always best when, when teams, uh, you know, can come to a solution or a strategy and reach a goal, uh, you know, I'd rather have a display campaign get more conversions than, say, my team's email campaign, uh, then, oh, well, my email campaign, uh, then saying, like, well, we should have stuck through my email campaign because I I, I believe in email, right? Yeah. Like, you know, we're, we're not here to to make our teams happy. We're here to make the client happy, so. Well, I have, I have two thoughts to add there. One is that we definitely do see higher lift in multi-channel campaigns to, compared to campaigns where we're only running one channel. So we know that there's power in what you're talking about and we see that in client outputs. Um, I also never, to your point, and that it's unique for every customer, there's no blanket strategy, but I'll, I'll share some, something that we've done. Um, I have some clients where I may run CTV to warm up the audience, kind of help build brand awareness and make them familiar. And then when I follow up with email, 
that's that's a more hard hitting call to action, but I've kind of warmed them up through email. I've also done vice versa. And it really depends on the client and the offer and what our goals are and how we were measuring it. Um, and so that just goes back to the comment at the top of our conversation, which is test, see what works, see what doesn't work. Um, my second thought was this. Because this is a webinar about email, I'm going to advocate for email. And one of the reasons I think email is so great, not only as part of your marketing mix, but thinking about it in relation to other marketing channels like CTV or like display and social advertising, is that email is more persistent. What do I mean by that? What I mean is it's sitting in my inbox. So if I'm scrolling on Instagram and I see a really cool ad and I'm not ready to click on it right then and I keep scrolling, it's so hard to scroll back up to the top and find, oh, where was that ad? I wanted to buy that blanket. I don't know. I forgot about it now. Versus if I have that sitting in my inbox, it's there. Now, whether I archive it or mark it as unread or whether I, you know, hopefully I look at it, but that's something that gets me really excited about email, even in contrast to all these other newer, more modern marketing channels, is that it's always there. My inbox always persists. I can always find what I'm looking for. And so then it goes down to what, what, are, you, what are you trying to accomplish as a marketer? It, and is email the right moment for me to get in front of somebody? So just had to had to get across my little, I don't want to dig at social media or display advertising, but that's one of the reasons I advocate for email a lot is because of that persistence. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and it's, it's, uh, you know, we send over a billion, if not close to 2 billion emails. Um, so there's a reason why it, you know, why we send emails and why clients send emails. So it's, uh, there's a lot of benefit of the channel. Um, there's a little more control over it than others, like you described. Um, so, um, yeah, it's it's definitely um, it, it it all they all work together. But we're big advocates of acquisition, email, obviously. So. Well, Aaron, I've got a couple questions popping up in the chat, and I want to make sure we're able to cover them. So, um, I have a question. Oh, this is. Um, so we did receive some questions prior to the webinar of things people asked us to make sure to cover. So it looks like a couple of these are in here too. Um, one of the questions is about the lists you're sending to and if we have any recommendations or insights on growing a list before sending a new campaign. I think I have a couple of ideas, but do you have any thoughts, Aaron? Yeah, so um, I, I guess I might not, I might need to ask questions about that question, but let's assume that it's about, I have a customer list and I want more people to be become, you know, be part of that list. I want them to start getting my newsletter, start getting my offers, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, so that that's pretty much what the acquisition channel is for. I mean, it's, that is, this is a good medium to do that. Um, so, uh, now the, the tricky part is before a new campaign, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but basically, um, if you want to grow your list, uh, your customer list, uh, any acquisition channel is, is a good place to start. Um, email is, I believe kind of the, the, the easiest foray into that would be, well, you, you have, a, you have a list, you need a data partner. We can, you know, pull an audience and get people interested in signing up. Um, if, the, if, if the question is intended more of, I have an audience or I have a list, but I don't know, you know, I, I need more. Um, well, then that's kind of where the data part comes in, right? You have a great data partner. They can help find you an audience that looks exactly like your existing customer base, you know, customer list. Um, um, or that's why you test, right? So maybe you don't think, you don't know who your real audience is. Data partner might give you insights into that, you start marketing to prospects, you'll start realizing who is engaging with your content uh, outside of whoever you know already is your customer. Um, yep. Yeah, I I agree with 
all of that, um, so just to try and increment on top of it. Um, I think that um, gated content can be a great way to get people to give you their email address. You know, what is something worth, you bet you have to have something really worth somebody being willing to give up their email address. So that's an organic way to grow your list versus I love some of the comments Aaron shared, which is, you know, when you're working with a data partner, you could do an analysis of your existing customers and find similar acquisition prospect emails that you can target. And the second thought I wanted to share is I also advocate for, for growing your own email list organically. Always offer email signup as an option. So I think of it hierarchically. Let's imagine you have a landing page and your main offer is to sign up for a demo of your product. Maybe somebody's not ready to do that. So give them other calls to action. Think of the page hierarchically, your primary CTA, your secondary CTA might be go read an article or whether it's secondary or tertiary, give people a chance to give you their email address. Maybe they're not ready to sign up for your demo yet, but they wanna get your monthly newsletter. And now you've got their email and now you can market to them. So both of those are kind of, uh, low and slow organic ways to build your list before a campaign. And then there's also the data angle where you can get a little more progress a little bit more quickly. Um, let me, I'm going back to the, the question list here. Aaron, if you had to choose one metric to define success or failure of a campaign, what would you say? That is somewhat of a loaded question. There is no, I would say there's no <laughs> one right answer. I think you had mentioned it earlier, Valerie. It, it's it's all based on what's the goal. Uh, now, uh, with without not giving an actual answer to that question, I would say usually the ultimate goal or success is acquiring a customer. Now that term could be a, somewhat loose. Is that, you know, is that someone who, you know, clicked and downloaded your white paper? Is that someone that viewed your YouTube video? Is that someone who you know, redeemed your coupon, you sent them. Um, that typically is the ultimate sign of a, a successful campaign. Um, but uh, sometimes, you know, there's brand awareness, there's there's sweepstakes, there's just things you want to get out in front of, of your audience that not necessarily is tied to one particular KPI. Uh, but uh, when we're talking about email acquisition, right, the important word is acquisition, right? So whatever an acquisition is to you, then that's that's that essentially should be the ultimate goal. Um, yeah, I mean, we always care about performance metrics like opens and clicks, but if an open and a click doesn't lead ultimately to that conversion or sale, right. like Aaron's saying, they're just they're leading indicators that can help us be smarter marketers. But I agree, the focus has to be on what's the what's the end business goal or business driver for what you're doing. I have another question, Aaron. So everything we're talking about, how many of these suggestions apply to B2B, apply to businesses marketing to businesses? Yeah, it, it, all, it all applies, I would say. Uh, the, the, the audience or the data aspect might be a little different or a little trickier uh, because that's the main difference, right? So because at the end of every B2B email is a person, right? So, so whoever you're engaging with, whether their profile is they work in IT or their profile is they have a dog and they have a medium income or whatever, right? That's just, that's the same way. It's a different way of looking at the same individual. So, so in the same sense, um, if you're targeting, if, you know, if you're a business targeting businesses, you kind of have the same strategies in place, right? You're making sure you know your audience, you know uh, the content, um, you know what the engagement is. Um, so, so the only real difference I would say is kind of on the data side, um, but the strategy itself though is how do you pick an audience? You know, when should you market to them? It's all about learning to be honest, right? So if someone tells you what's the best time of day to send an email, honestly, you know, I'm sure you can find studies that say Tuesday at nine central is the best time, but say you send your emails, well, it turns out, no, Friday at 1 p.m. was the best. So you don't know until you have the data to prove it or, you know, the insights. 
Um, so, and I would say that also applies to B2B, right? So. Yeah, great answer. Um, I'm gonna put out a final call for any other questions. If anybody has any burning questions, please make sure you add them to the chat. And Aaron, I have one we haven't addressed. How easy or difficult is it to scale my campaign quickly versus something like a CTV campaign? So uh, yeah, email, since it's not tied to any particular uh, like third-party bidding system or uh, you know, segment, you know, uh, some kind of, you know, if you have a if you have a good data partner and and a good ESP, it scales quite fast. Uh, the question is, where is the line, right? Like you you want to make sure your campaign is effective. So going from I have an audience of say potential audience of say five million. Let me do some testing and send some creative and subject line to say 1 million, right? And then you can scale up. Maybe there's ways to get that 5 million to 10 million. Um, but what you don't want to do is say, I have an audience of roughly 5 million, I think might to my profile. Well, then, and then you test and like, oh, let's send to 100 million. Let's send to everyone in the, in the, that my data partner has. That's not the right way of scaling. But, um, but fortunately, um, email and with a good ESP, the, the with all the technical complexities that are you know under the hood and behind the scenes, if those are all in place, you can scale as quickly as you need. Um, and, and we do too. We, we've done it plenty of times. Um, so it, it's just it, it's a the channel is is very it's not limited and it's it's uh, it's uh, it's very nimble and flexible as a marketer for you. And you can send as often as you want, as little as you want, to as many people as you want, or to as little as pe many you know, people as you want. So, yeah, you know, one thing, Aaron, we we didn't touch on, and we're ending the near the end of the webinar, nearing the end of the webinar, um, is attribution. So, just really briefly, uh, you know, if I want to know, hey, did somebody who used my campaign, like, how do I know this campaign was effective? Can you just comment on attribution really briefly? Yeah, it's another great benefit of email, right? So you know the individuals that receive the email, you know when they received it, you know when they read it, when they clicked on it. Um, so having insights into that and tying it back to any kind of say, you know, your new, all of your new customers for the month or everyone that filled out this form, um, you know, it, it's an, you can tie it back to the campaign. Um, and, and if you have the right partner, not just email, but that will apply across the board to all marketing channels. You can know, you know, oh, I know this individual received an email these these three days during this month. They also were, you know, they also were served the CTV ad these three days as well. Um, things like that. And that really, without having that knowledge, then it's, yeah, it's going to be tough to know if, if your campaign hit, hit the ultimate goal, right? Um, so being able to tie it back to the audience is tremendous. Um, so, uh, which is a, is a benefit of email. Um, you know exactly who you're sending it to. You know everything about them. If you have a great data, data to partner, you probably know more than you think you would know about someone. And, mm -hmm. uh, and all the interaction with the email is, 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 is captured or uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's, it's there. Um, so you just gotta use it. Yeah, and, and that's a great takeaway for um, going back to being conscious and having a plan, if your campaigns are integrated with one another, if the prospect data is the throughput and you're touching those same people, whether it's on email or other channels, um, if there's a unified identifier for those people throughout all of your channels, now you can do this closed loop reporting and you know exactly where, where did your marketing dollars go? How much did you have to spend to get that lead? And um, even can find out, okay, what do those people look like? What are the profile of my people that are actually converting? So that what I'm describing there is the connection between data and activation through email and, and other channels as well. Uh, so we, we have approached our end time. I want to Thank everybody for coming. We really appreciate it. And I want to end on, Aaron, 
Any final thoughts, anything you want to share with the group before we say goodbye? Yeah, so first, uh, you know, thank, thank, thank you everyone for attending and, and listening to us chat. Um, so yesterday I was kind of tinkering around with, you know, how do I, what kind of, everyone loves an analogy, right? So I was like, what kind of analogy can I make? And it's pretty fitting. It's no shock for people that know me. Um, I would like uh, to say email as a channel is, is kind of like a classic car, right? So when it, when it first came out, it was, it was new, it had new technology. No one's seen it before. You know, there was things under the hood. No one knew they did what they did. Uh, and then, you know, years go on, you know, 10, 15 years. And, oh, well, that's obsolete, right? Like everyone's talking about this new channel. Every time about the digital landscape has changed so much or the automotive landscape has changed so much. Oh, we don't bother with carbureted engines. Oh, you have drums, like we have disc brakes. Uh, you know, you do email, we have, you know, Facebook ads, whatever it is, right? And then as time goes on, you start to realize, well, you know, that, that old classic car I used to be able to fix. I used to, you know, open the hood and, you know, see where it was leaking. I could tinker with, I can fix it myself. I didn't need to go through a specialist for every single part under the hood. Um, I have, I, I could do it myself or I could work with one, you know, mechanic, if you will. Um, and, and I kind of find that as, as technology, as a landscape changes, uh, which is great because there's a lot of cool things with AI and machine learning and how different channels can communicate and it's all automated, uh, but you lose a little bit of control. And the nice thing about email, that control is always there. So it's you sending email, you choosing, you can utilize AI and machine learning, right? That's great. Uh, but, but, you know, but under the hood, nothing has changed. It's still that old carbureted engine with drum brakes. So I'll leave it at that. I love that. I love that. Keep, keep it simple. And then the marketers in control of all the bells and whistles. That's a great analogy, Aaron. Everybody, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today. We really appreciate it. Go get yourself a classic car. Thank you.